Hi, I'm Dr. Sridhar Ganpati, a practicing pediatrician from Mumbai. The topic for today is interpretation in case of paraparesis, in a case of paraparesis. So what is paraparesis? It's basically a motor weakness of the lower extremity and you could have an association of sensory, autonomic, bowel bladder involvement along with it and it may even extend to the lower thorax. So first comes localization. So when you come to localization, it's usually a myelopathy. It's either in the thorax, the lumbar or the sacral segment. It could be in the brain, the parasagital area. It could be at the level of the anterior horn cell, the plexus, the nerve, the neuromuscular junction and muscle. So what we are trying to do is divide it into two neuronal axes, the upper motor neuron up to the anterior horn cells and the anterior horn cells and beyond that is the lower motor neuron because that makes it very easy. So when you have an upper motor neuron lesion, it is spastic paraparesis usually and the lower motor neuron is a flaccid paraparesis. The upper motor neuron, the reflexes are very brisk. The lower motor neuron, it is uh, subdued. And the upper motor neuron, you have a Babinski, which is positive, whereas it's negative in the lower motor neuron. Atrophy, fasciculations, they're all seen with anterior horn cell disease. The next comes, what are the causes of paraparesis in our setup? It's usually the T. So you could have tuberculosis as an infection. You could have transverse myelitis. You could have a tumor. You could have trauma. These are the common causes of uh, paraparesis in our setup. We need to understand the neuroanatomy before we jump into management or localization of paraparesis. So the spinal cord stops growing, the vertebral column keeps growing, so there is a disparity or a discrepancy. You cannot correlate the cord levels with the vertebra, so you need to understand that the spinal cord stops at L1, it's usually L1, L2, and the, uh, the dural sac continues till S2. So that when you look at the cord segment and the vertebra, you need to understand that the upper cervical might gel with the vertebral levels, but as you go down, it is a factor of one, and when you reach the upper thoracic, it's a factor of two, lower thoracic, it becomes a factor of three, and then by the time it is T10, T11, and T12. T10 represents L1, L2. T11 will represent L3, L4. And T12 will represent L5. And L1 will represent the rest. So that's the usual way we link the cord segment with the vertebral levels. The three tracks that are important to understand when we deal with paraparesis is the corticospinal tract, which gives the motor input the sensory tracts, that is the dorsal or the postural, uh, the posterior tract, as well, which uh, takes care of proprioception, joint sense, position, and the lateral spinothalamic tract, which takes care of pain, temperature, and throat touch. We need to know a little bit about these three tracts. If you take the corticospinal tract, it starts off from the motor cortex, parasitical area for the leg, uh, when you look at that homunculus representation and it starts to come down corona radiata, internal capsule, at the level of the medulla, the pyramids, it decussates to the other side and ultimately ends up at the anterior horn cell. Then if you look at uh, the ascending tracts, so this was the descending tracts. So when you look at the ascending tracts, you have the posterior column which takes care of proprioception, joint sense, position sense, vibration, through, uh, and touch. Whereas you have the spinothalamic tract, which is on the lateral side. The, the dorsal tract is on the dorsal uh, uh, position, highly myelinated. And uh, the representation there on a transverse section would be, medially you'll have the sacrum and the lower limb fibers, whereas laterally you'll have the cervical and thoracic fibers. Whereas if you look at the spinothalamic tract, which is uh, the lateral spinothalamic tract in the cross section of the uh, spinal cord, you'll find that these fibers, as soon as they enter the spinal cord, they decussate to the opposite side. So two levels below the level of the lesion, 
So any lesion will give rise to symptoms on the contralateral side, whereas in posterior tracts it will be on the ipsilateral side and the corticospinal also it will be on the ipsilateral side. Again, the representation on the spinothalamic as well as the corticospinal tract at the transverse level, if you see it's the, uh, the sacrum and the lower limbs are represented laterally, whereas the thoracic and cervical is medially. So why this becomes important? Any compressive lesion or uh, something that is pressing from the outside will have an effect on the lower limbs first. Whereas if you have an intramedullary lesion, they usually give rise to bladder involvement and that's the way it is. Coming to the blood supply, if you take the blood supply, you need to understand that the anterior cerebral, uh, the anterior spinal artery supplies the anterior two-third of the spine, whereas the posterior one-third is supplied by the posterior artery. And that is a watershed area between T4 and T6. So anything that brings down the supply in the vertebral vessels can drastically bring down the blood flow at this level, like a, a aortic dissection or somebody going into shock. So we have now understood the neuroanatomy. Now let's talk a little bit on symptomatology. So let's see the onset. An acute onset is usually vascular transverse myelitis. So it could be injury, it could be ischemia, it could be transverse myelitis. A subacute could be a subacute combined degeneration. Uh, what we do see is the B12 and the copper deficiency and they usually affect the highly myelinated fibers. So uh, it's not a surprise that the posterior columns as well as the spinal, uh, the corticospinal tracts are affected whereas the spinothalamic tracts are not affected because they are not highly myelinated at all. Then you take the chronic ones. The chronic ones are like the cervical spondylosis as well as the hereditary spastic paraplegia. It's a slow growing process. Let's take pain. So when you take pain, it's something like the abdominal pain where you have a somatic pain and a visceral pain. Anything which comes from inside, like an intramedullary lesion, will basically give rise to a funicular pain which is deep-seated which is, you cannot pinpoint, it's in an area of numbness, lancinating. Whereas anything which is compressive, uh, which is disc related, which is pressing on a nerve root, which is a radicular pain, shooting pain like a disc pressing on a lumbar root and you're getting the sciatica, uh, will give you a hint as to where the problem is. Also, if you have bony tenderness or a paravertebral spasm, that also gives rise to pain and that will also give you a hint as to what's going on from the outside. So that's a little bit on pain, but we need not forget the pain that is associated with neurogenic claudication. Now, this is a pain that is seen with spinal canal stenosis and some of the spinal vascular structures wherein you get pain on standing or walking, but you don't get pain when walking upstairs or when you are sitting and bending forward, the pain disappears. This is seen in spinal canal stenosis and some vascular problems of the spinal system. This is unlike in a vascular claudication wherein the vessels are not well felt and walking up will give rise to more pain. Then let's come down to the motor, sensory and the bladder bowel involved. So we are now trying to find out where the lesion is. So if you could have a lesion at the level of the parasitical area, like a meningioma. You could have an anterior cerebral artery, which is an aberrant vessel, wherein it's an unpaired single anterior cerebral artery, which has undergone thrombosis. All these can give rise to uh, a paraplegia, but they will have neighboring symptoms. What are the neighboring signs and symptoms? You will have headache, you may have seizures, that will point to an upper story effect. Then coming lower down, it's more sensible to talk about the thoracic, lumbar and sacral spine rather than the cervical. Because when you have the upper cervical which is involved, you may have the diaphragm which is involved, especially C3 and C5 level. And you may also have a quadriparesis more than or a tetraparesis more than a paraparesis. So in the thoracic level, you'll definitely get a level which could present like 
a girdle, dysesthesia or hyperesthesia or almost like an intercostal neuralgia and you'll find uh, the system being absolutely normal above the level and below the level you'll find sensory, motor, uh, autonomic and even uh, bladder bowel uh, uh, problems. And we look at dermatomal level, myotomal level, we look at reflex level when coming to localization. So how do we localize? T4 is at the nipple level, T10 is at the umbilicus, T3 is the axilla. A rough way of looking at it, any lesion above T4 can also give rise to severe autonomic disturbances above T4. Now let's go down a little bit, T10 for example. If T10 is the level of lesion, what happens? We do a beaver sign wherein we ask the patient to lift his head in the lying down position against resistance and you will find that the umbilicus moves upwards. That means the lower part of the rectus is uh, not functioning. So this is the way you localize lesions. And you will have sensory, motor, bladder, bowel involvement, lower down, even sexual dysfunction. And above the so-called sensory level, everything appears normal. If you take the lumbar, let me give you an example again. Let's take L2 for example. The cremastric and the patella are lost. The ankle is hyperreflexic. And the anterolateral aspect of the thigh, the sensations are normal. So you look at reflex, you look at dermatomal and you look at myotomal level. Still going down further, we do know that at L1 it stops the spinal cord and the dural sac at S2. And here you have the corda and the conus. You need to understand that conus lesions usually are hyperreflexes, hyperreflexic. The, uh, the equina, the corda equina lesions are hyporeflexic. The bladder involvement is much earlier in the uh, corda, I mean in the um, conus medullaris, whereas the corda will have it a bit later. The, uh, since it's a set of fibers, the corda equina, you will get a lot of radicular pain, uh, which is not seen in uh, the conus medullaris. It is more symmetric in the conus medullaris. So that's the way we go about. And then we look at whether it is a compressive lesion or a non-compressive lesion. Then we look at various cord syndromes. Here we need to understand when we look at compressive lesions that if it is extramedullary, uh, we take it as either extradural or intradural. When you have these extramedullary uh, things pressing on to the spinal cord, what you do get is you get radicular pain. And since it's from outside, inside, and we do know that the lower limb fibers are outside, the lower limbs are affected first. And this is as far as even the corticospinal as well as the Lat uh, lateral th spinothalamic tracts are concerned. If it's an intramedullary lesion, you get the funicular type of pain. You have this dissociate uh, uh, type of sensory loss wherein pain temperature as they dis decussate to the opposite side are affected, but the posterior columns are not affected, like in a syringomyelia. And then we come to uh, the various cord syndrome. So in the cord syndrome, if you have a pure motor paraparesis, you think of a myotrophic lateral sclerosis, hereditary spastic paraplegia, and in our country during famines, the Kayseri Dal and Lactirism. If you have a postrolateral syndrome, you think of subacute combined degeneration, B12, it could be copper deficiency, it could even be an HIV coming into play. And like I told you, the postrolateral cords are highly myelinated. If you have a hemisection, you get the brown sequard. So what happens? You have pain and temperature affected on one side and the corticospinal and the posterior columns affected on the ipsilateral side. On the contralateral, you have the pain and temperature which is affected. So looking at where the problem is, looking at the neuroanatomy, looking at the distribution, you come to a conclusion. And to sum it up, let me tell you what is very important is you need to see more in neurological cases. Here sufficient. So if you have somebody walking with uh, a toe walking or a high arched feet, somebody who slippers slip out, somebody who is not able to get up from the sitting position, 
you know when he's not when he's got a proximal weakness it's probably a myopathy when he has a distal weakness it's usually a sensory i mean it's a peripheral neuropathy and um, you look at head tilt because when you have a sensory ataxia and you are trying to uh, um, adjust with your uh, a visual acuity you get clues so looking at the patient will give you much more than just examining a patient on the couch thank you